morning, everyone. I, I wish everybody online could see the craziness that's going on in this building right here. It's like a studio audience, except no, everyone's excited about seeing each other and they're not worried about what's going on in church. Well, good morning. I want to welcome everybody and thank you so much for joining us today at Community Life Church on this beautiful Sunday morning. My name is Scott Verano, and I'm the lead pastor and maybe lead, uh, ring leader for the circus. And um, it is so awesome to have you connected online as well as here in this place. I love what I get to do, and I love being a part of your lives and this family. Just a great, beautiful Sunday morning. I want to make one announcement, and then we're going to stand up and pray and get on started with this wonderful day. So Kat and Katie um, in the discipleship ministry, they are launching a new ministry. They're not really launching it. They're just about to make it explode. Um, On May 16th on Navarre Beach at 4 o'clock, they are hosting what they're calling um, the Military Beach Bash. And they're opening up ministry to the entire military. And I'm going to tell you, this is going to be a great resource and outreach um, to our military. We already have tons of military families that are part of the church, but this is going to be a great outreach to a lot of those young guys and gals that are associated at Hurlburt and Eglin, and just really kind of give them an open door and invitation. So I tell you that um, because I know there are also many folks that are retired military, and you might consider yourself a great resource for for Kat and Katie to help put this ministry together. So register, be a part of this event, and be a part of what really is going to be a next big reach of our church into the community. Um, You can register for that by texting Beach Bash to that 94,000 number. You'll get the information, or just go find Kat and Katie, and they'll get you set up and, um, and, and really let you know about the rest of the ministry. But we're excited about what God is doing in all areas and aspects of ministry, but really in this new reach that, that we're being a part of, I think it's going to be a really great resource um, for our military personnel here in our community. You guys ready for a wonderful Sunday? Yeah. All right, I'm excited about today. So I invite you to go ahead and stand. I got you. See, that was perfect. I mean, you have to sit down. Um, and let's, let's pray the Lord's Prayer, get our hearts on the same page, and then just expect that God is going to do something awesome today. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this morning. Uh, There's no question. There's a buzz. There's an excitement. It feels good to be in church. It feels good to be connected online, to experience life and what you're doing here in this building, what you're doing here in this community. Um, God, it's not lost on me that for the last two days, 150 plus women gathered in this space And they wrestled with what it means to give their entire lives over to you. What does it mean to choose Christ and know that that our very breath is at stake and the words that we carry mean more than we could ever possibly imagine? And so, God, we see you churning and raising and preparing the hearts of the women for something so incredible. And, And, God, we know that that bubbles over into the men as we continue to study and learn and grow. And, God, there is something that you're doing in our hearts and in our lives today. And so, God, we embrace it as we look forward to to, to each and every step along the way. God, you know the burdens and you know the weights that we carry in this place. And this morning, we just offer them back to you. And we pray that in this time of worship, that as we lift you up, God, that you'll take those burdens and you'll lift our very spirits. God, we love you. We trust you. And it's in your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. So glad to have you here for worship this morning. We're just going to start up by singing a hymn this morning. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Oh, where is salvation and purchase of
worship you this morning. We do sing out your praise. God, we thank you for who you are and the blessings that we have in our lives. And so we just take time to devote to you today. Lord, let this be your day. Our hearts belong to you as Jim Bell comes to deliver the word this morning. Just bless it. God, I pray you would open up scripture, bring insight, bring revelation to the word this morning. Uh, we are your vessel, vessels, Lord, and we, we love you. And we want to, to be here for you today. And we want to have your will come and your purpose in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, everybody. You can be seated. Good morning. I lost a little bit of weight this week. About six pounds on the hairdresser's floor. And it was all gray. I don't understand that. Well, you know what? We have been in a a series on prayer for quite a while now. We started, oh, months ago looking at prayer that we can find in the Old Testament. What does that teach us? And then a few weeks back, we started looking at new prayer in we can find in the New Testament. And last week, we began to look at the prayer life of Jesus himself through the eyes, if you remember, of an unnamed disciple. Unnamed disciple, don't know who he was, but he was watching Jesus pray. And as we look together at Jesus praying, I hope from last week we experienced, as did this unnamed disciple, a growing understanding or a growing conviction, if you will, that, that prayer was, is really the secret and the center, if you will. It's really, really focused of this amazing life that we live on earth today, that prayer is right smack dab in the middle of all of that. And it's both the most natural and it's the most amazing thing that we can ever describe. I also hope this, that we recognize that there has never been a more important request ever made by any man or woman that ever lived than the request that was made by this disciple where he just said, Lord, teach us to pray. In answer to that request, Jesus gave them what you just prayed, which we commonly call the Lord's Prayer, but in effect, it's, we really can call it the model prayer. And we have a brief account of it in verses 2 through 4 of Luke chapter 11. And this is what Luke writes. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. Now, if you check that out 
and make a comparison to what you can find in the Gospel of Matthew, you're going to find that they don't exactly, they don't exactly match up. It's a little bit of different from Matthew to Luke. And that's because undoubtedly Jesus paraphrased this or talked about this prayer numerous times in the course of his ministry. Because not just with prayer, but with all the parables and all the truths that he gave, he did this on a continual basis. So he frequently repeated certain truths that he gave out during his three and a half years of ministry. But it doesn't matter. However, whatever form you're looking at, the Lord's Prayer is, is large enough and it's rich enough to cover everything and everything that we're ever need in our lives. The prayer that we just looked at falls into two uh, pretty obvious divisions. It's highlighted by the use of two pronouns. The first part of this prayer centers on God, and the pronoun we see it most often is the pronoun you. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. The second part concerns you and I, concerns mankind. And we see there the pronoun is us. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins. Lead us not into temptation. So you've got these two pronouns, you and us. Now today we're going to confine ourselves to the very first three utterances that center around the person, the character, the nature, and the being of God himself. And it's not an accident that Jesus Christ prays in this exact form. When you see any prayer done by Jesus, you always notice one thing. He always puts God first. He puts the Father first. That probably indicates a weakness, if you will, in our own prayer life. Because so many times in our prayer, it begins not with you, it begins with what? us or, or me. We almost rush into a series of wants, needs, desires, pleading petitions that have to do with our problems and the things that we're facing and our needs and our irritations. It's all about, it becomes all about us. And we run into prayer that way, just saying, okay, here it is. We, it, it, as fast as we can get it out of our mouth, the better. So when we look at this model prayer, it's, it serves to focus us, if you will, upon what is already troubling us and to heighten our awareness of what we really lack. And that's, been, that's by starting with the Lord and giver of life. You know, that could also be because we're throwing this out there so often. That can be a reason why sometimes frequently we end up sometimes more distracted or more distressed or more frustrated than when we began to pray. But Jesus here shows us another way, a better way. We begin with God. We don't begin with ourselves and what we need. we got to slow things down in prayer. And we take a calm, we take a reassuring glance and gaze at Jesus, at His, at his greatness, at His eagerness to give, His patience, His love, all the wonderful qualities we know God possesses. And when we do that, when we slow down and we focus on that before we get into anything else, the first thing we receive in prayer is a calmness. You're reminding yourself of who He is. So your spirit becomes calm. And we see that there's no reason for us to plunge in the head first into all these panic words that we use to say, I need, I want, I got to have. That's why this prayer begins with a word of relationship. Father. A relational term. There's a reverence about that word. That word Father. That I think we lose a lot of times in today's world. But that relational word Father is essential to know to whom we are praying. Now when we come to prayer we're not talking about God. We are not engaging in some sort of a theological dialogue in this prayer. 
We're not talking about God. We are talking with God. And there is a huge difference in that. We're going to converse with him directly, one-on-one. And so it's very important to understand who it is that we are speaking to. And that prayer and any true prayer must begin with a concept of God as the Father. Now that eliminates some things. If you you start prayer there, that it's going to eliminate some things. It's going to make it easy for you. It shows you that real prayer is not addressed to the chairman of the Committee for Welfare and Relief. Sometimes our prayers sort of take on that type of uh, aspect, if you will. We come expecting something to be given to us, a, maybe a handout. We want something to be poured into our lips, something we think we need. And in making that appeal, we are simply filling out the proper bureaucratic red tape forms, you know, in triplicate, to make sure we get this all taken care of. In the same vein, our prayers are not to be addressed to the chief of the Bureau of Investigation. That's not God either. It's never merely to be a confession of the things that we have done wrong, we've screwed up, we've failed at, with the hope that, you know, if we throw ourselves onto the mercy of the court, that this this judge, in effect, is going to do something for us. So it's not those two things. It's also not an appeal to the Secretary of the Treasury. You know, you need, you need some financial help. You need some resources to do all these wonderful things that you've been called to do. So, you know, it's sort of like your friendly international banker who's going to hear this plea, and we hope that that banker is going to show up with some interest in the financial progress of the things that we've got going on in our lives. So it's none of those things. Prayer is to be to a father. Prayer is to be to a father with a father's heart, with a father's love, a father's patience, a father's strength. And the very first and truest note of prayer must be our recognition that we come to God, viewing God that way. We've got to come to him as a child, in trust, in utter simplicity, and with all the frankness of a little child. We must hear him, and we must come to him as a child. If we don't do those types of things, then really it's not prayer. It's been pointed out that the word father answers all the philosophical questions about the character and nature of God. A father above all things, is what? It's a, it's a person. A father is a person. Therefore, God is not some blind force somewhere behind the creation of the universe. A father is able to listen. He's able to understand. He's able to hear. And God is not simply something that is impersonal. It's an impersonal first force or thing or a spirit. He's not impersonal at all. He's not aloof from all our troubles. He's not aloof and off to the side about all the trials and tribulations that we go through. He's not sitting over there just looking at it. Above all, a father is predisposed. It's in his makeup. If there's such a thing as God's DNA, it's there. And it's predisposed by his love and relationship to give a very attentive in a very open and a very careful, attentive and attractive ear to what his child has to say. God is this way. And from a father, a child can always expect a reply. Can always expect a reply. So Jesus goes on to teach us more of what a father is like in the parable that actually follows this prayer. And the point of all this is that God is interested, vitally interested, in what we have to say. Now, our spouse not be, may be not interested in what we have to say. Our kids may not be interested. But I want to tell you one thing. God the Father is very interested in what you have to say. And, he's a, and he knows 
that you should be expecting a reply from him. You know, we're not only to address God as Father by just taking that word upon our lips, but we are also to believe that he is a Father. Because all God makes available to mankind must always come through faith. It's the key. It's the lock and key. It, it, it's the thing that opens everything up to us. Faith. It almost uh, always has to operate in our lives through belief. But belief invariably involves commitment. Oh, what a bad word that is. Actual commitment. And it's a commitment of the will. It's to change. It's a moving in the deepest part of our human nature. So when we, when you and I come to prayer, if we begin to address this prayer as Almighty God, and a lot of us do, if we start a prayer like Almighty God or, or Magnificent Creator or Ancient of Days, I think when we do that, it really sort of betrays our our ignorance, or our, and it shows our unbelief, because the greatest authority on the subject of prayer, Jesus Christ, says that God is to be called what? Father. That's not to say that the Father is not the magnificent creator, that he's not the ancient of days, that he's not almighty God, he's all those things. But to you and I in prayer, he is not those things, he is Father, relational, come to me, Sit in my lap. Talk to me. Let me know what's going on in your life. Let's just dialogue. And don't ever feel that you ever need to leave my lap. That's the type of God we go to in prayer. The second note of prayer is one of, this is another word we don't like, surrender. Surrender. He says, hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Now, no doubt this is the petition that makes hypocrites out of you and out of me and out of most of us. You know, certainly we can say, Father, that we can do that. That's not a problem. And we can say that with, with certainty and with grateful sincerity. But when we say, hallowed be thy name, it's almost like we say it with a little bit of a guilty knowledge, if you will, that as we pray, there are, we know there are areas in our lives in which his name is not hallowed at all. And if we were completely honest, we don't want it to be hallowed. You know, when we say, hallowed be in thy name, we are really praying this. What we're saying is this, may the whole, may the completeness of my entire life be a source of delight to you, God. Father, and may my whole life be an honor to the name in which I bear, which is your name. So hallowed be your name. It's the same thing we find if you take a look at Psalm 19. It's the same thing we find in this prayer of David where he says this, May these words of my mouth, which he's talking about prayer, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. David is praying, hallowed be thy name. Now, trouble is, and I don't have to tell you this, is that we so frequently as men and women know there are great areas of our lives that are not hallowed. We can think about them right now. There are certain monopolies in your life. There are certain shrines in your life. There are certain altars in your life. There are certain temples, if you will, in your life that are reserved strictly for us, for me. Privileged areas, areas of, of privileged people or privileged relationships, privileged activities, which we do not wish to surrender. These are areas that, unfortunately, when you get down to it, they mean more to us than the name of God. 
But when we pray this, if we pray it in any degree whatsoever of sincerity or of openness or of honesty, we are praying, Lord, I am opening to you every closet in my life. I'm taking out every skeleton and I'm going to give you complete view, if you will. I want, to, I want you to examine everything. In effect, I'm saying, hallowed be your name. Do you see that without this second requisite of real prayer, of opening our lives and our hearts to surrender to his lordship, that real genuine contact with God is not something that is, well, it's going to be more fleeting. It's going to be here and there. It's going to be hit or miss. Any real touching of God's power in your life, experiencing his wonders in your life, are not going to be available until we pray, hallowed be thy name. We're not only aware that in each of us, there are areas where God's name is is not hallowed, where he cannot write his name in our life, and we are deeply aware in our very being that none of us can make our lives like this. That no matter how we may try to arrange every area of our lives to please him, there is a fatal weakness, there is a flaw that somehow makes us miss the, the mark because we are really not inviting him totally into our lives. And we're all like that. If you're feeling that right now, join the club. You're, the, you're part of the club called mankind, human beings. Even when we try hard, even when we, you know, we go like this and say, well, I'm going to be different. Even when we try hard, we find ourselves unable to do this. But you're going to notice that this prayer is not phrased as a simple confession or an expression of repentance to the Father. We are not to pray, as we are, as so many of us frequently do, Father, help me to be good. How often do we pray like that? Help me to be good. Or, you know, I need some improvement. Help me to be better in this area or that area, God. We all pray like that at times. When we do that, we are missing out. Because hallowed be thy name is really a cry of helpless trust in which we are simply standing before God and saying, Father, Once again, the relational term, Father, not only do I know there are vast areas of my life where your name is not hallowed, but I know also that only you are the only one that can hallow them. And I'm quite willing to simply stand absolutely still, focused on you, and let you be the Holy One who will actually be the first in my life. Not anything in that closet, not anything in that closet. You are going to be number one in my life. And when we pray like that, then we discover that the rest sort of falls in place, falls in line for us. The man who lets God be his Lord, the man or woman who allows surrendering to him is drawn quite spontaneously into a great learning process. And he or she becomes a different person. Martin Luther once said, he said this, you do not command a stone which is lying in the sun to be warm. It will be warm all by itself. So when we say, Father, there is no area of my life that I am not willing to let you talk to me about, There are no hidden curtains. There are no empty cloths. There's nothing in my life that you cannot address with me and I'm not going to open up to you. There's no area where I'm going to hide from you. Could be my sexual life, I'm not going to hide it. My business life, I'm not going to hide it. My family life, not going to hide it. My recreational life, not going to hide it. My hobbies, my downtime, I'm not going to hide it from you. Nowhere. That, in effect, is saying, hallowed be thy name. When we pray that way, we discover that God will walk into the dark closets of your life and my life where sometimes the odor 
is so overwhelming, we, don't, we can't stand the smell. And he will go in there and he will clean it out. He will freshen it up. He's going to straighten everything away. And it's going to make it fit for his dwelling place. In the Apostle John's first letter, he says this to us. If we walk in the light, and when he says walk in the light, he's not talking sinlessness. He's not talking perfection. But he says, if we walk in the light, it means where God can see everything. If we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship, relation once again. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. He is taking that blood, and he's cleaning out every closet that you have in your life that you have kept closed for so many years. Third cry of this true prayer is a cry for hope. Thy kingdom come. Now this can be a sigh or it could be a hope for heaven. You know, I, don't, I think it's probably normal for a lot of us to somehow, we have periods and times of our lives in our day-to-day living that we get almost homesick, if you will, for heaven once in a while. We just say, I sort of feel like Paul. I, like I'm, it's better if I, I leave this world and I would be with Christ. You know, we long to be free from the treasures, the trials. Sometimes the weight of the world seems like it's, it's on our head. We seem to live out our lives almost like, like Bill Murray. Remember the movie Groundhog Day? Where he was caught in a in a life whirlwind or rewind, if you will, and he was living the same day over and over and over again. Sometimes our lives feel that way. We, we read about the glories described in heaven and wish we could experience it all, but right, every bit of it right now. But the words, thy kingdom come, can also be a cry for heaven to come to earth. We see that in the cry one of the most beautiful pieces of music you've ever heard. And that's Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. The kingdom of this world is become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ and of His Christ. Some of the most powerful words ever written to music. This prayer is much more than a hopeful or a wistful Look into the future, whether on earth or off the earth. It's more than that. It's a cry that God's will be done through and and by means of the blood and sweat and tears of our lives right now, today. Thy kingdom come through what I am going through at this very moment. That's what this prayer means. Scripture reveals to us a truth that men, women would never know by themselves. But it comes to us very self-evidently as we look at the life through the lens, not of our own eyes, we take it through the lens of the Word of God, the truth of God. And that, that God builds His kingdom, so to speak, right now with us. And He's doing it in ways that you're not even aware of. It's almost like it's in secret the way he builds his kingdom in your life. Because I think you can agree that when it is least evident that he is at work, that that oftentimes is frequently the time when he's accomplished the most and you're the least aware of it. When we are least aware of his working and we look back, whether it be a month later or years later or decades later, we find that wow, he was accomplishing so much in my life and I was not even aware of it. Behind all the scaffolding of tragedy and depression and despair and trial and all that stuff, God is frequently erecting his empire of love and glory in your life. These trials we go through, hardships, disappointments, heartbreak, disasters, 
When we think God is silent, when he's not got anything to say to us, and we feel like we have been left out or forgotten about or abandoned, when we feel God has removed his hand and his face from us, and we no longer sense any type of friendship of his presence, I want to assure you that God is frequently accomplishing the greatest things of all because he's doing things in your life. He's preparing you. You know, the circumstances and the experiences of life itself become very, very fertile soil, very, very fertile ground for God to use to build his kingdom. And he does it one life and one crisis at a time. I have a tendency myself, mea culpa here, I, I have a tendency to be judgmental. I've always carried that. I always have a tendency to be be self-righteous. If you don't believe me, ask my wife. It's true. It's always been very easy for me to see the plight of others, and my default position would be to say, well, you know, that's unfortunate, but, you know, if I was in your situation... I would have never done that. I look at sometimes and say, you know, if if you would only be able to see the damage that is being caused by your action or inaction, can't they see what is happening and where it's going to lead? That's my default position. I've got to give that up. That's a, that's a closet. That's a skeleton. That, that, need, that door needs to be completely open and the odor needs to be, to be cleaned up. But as, as, as I have matured over the years, through the years, through the Word, through being in the Word, through listening to the Word, through, through teaching the Word, God's taught me a whole lot of lessons. And He's dropped into my lap situations and circumstances that have humbled me. And they've cut the rug out from beneath my feet when I thought I was right. They allowed me to see clearly how wrong I had been. I know maybe some of you can, can identify with some of the things I'm saying. Maybe it's not those things that, that I've had a default position to, but you have your own. It is through these ways that God builds his kingdom, one believer at a time. Out of darkness, God calls forth light. Out of despair, God calls forth hope. And from death comes resurrection. And you can't have resurrection until you have a death. You can't have resurrection without a death or hope, without despair. You can't have light without darkness. So these are all part of our human experiences as we go through this life. And this is what this prayer senses. and It's what it means. It is simple, childlike, trustful, and giving of a surrender that rises out of the helpless need of a child to touch a father's heart. That's what this model prayer is. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are but little children. And like children, so often we do not understand and comprehend the mysteries of life itself. We don't know the ways in the world of men and women But Lord, we pray that through these very circumstances of which we're going through, in which we now find ourselves, through these present troubles, these present struggles and trials that we're going through right now, we pray that through all those things that we return to this model of prayer and conversation with you. And we can say, 
thy kingdom come. And we ask this all in Christ's precious name. Amen. Today is a day of remembrance and communion where we remember who we are. We remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We remember what what took place in that upper room during the Passover feast where it was changed completely. Where Jesus broke the bread and gave it to his disciples says, take and eat. This is my body, broken for you. And that body was broken on the cross just hours later. He took up the cup, says, take and drink. This is my blood. And as often as you drink this, do so in remembrance to me. Today we celebrate that. We celebrate a death. We also celebrate a resurrection. We celebrate thy kingdom come into our hearts. When you come to take communion, we ask you to hold your hand out. The ladies will put the bread in there. They have gloves. They'll also put a container of the wine or the grape juice in there that you can partake. And if you need gluten-free, I'll be up here to provide that for you and serve you myself. Would you come?